I came home in February to like do the work to go internally and to calm down and to connect with myself on a deeper level. And what happened is the second day I was home, I found a weed delivery service. <laughs> and I was so confident that I could introduce weed with balance into my life now. And boy, let me tell you, I am not there. No. <laughs> <laughs> Did not expect it to go there. <laughs> Essentially what happened is since February, I've been in a weed cloud. And it's not to get high, it's to get numb. And I was becoming more and more aware that I'm closing myself off to my sensitivity. And then it becomes this classic dance of accepting where I'm at and this is what it is it's okay versus yo get up and, and move yeah. around a little bit right so I I was struggling with that and literally literally today this morning three hours ago uh, I woke up there was a thunderstorm and well let me rewind two days ago I I stopped smoking I said, I've had enough. I, I need to stop. And it was really difficult for two days. I told my family, guys, I'm going to be grumpy. I, I need some space. Last night, I had the first dream that I've had in months. Because when I'm smoking weed, I don't dream. And who shows up? None other than my dead mother is in my dream. And I, she was driving. I was in the passenger seat whatever symbolism that is and i put my arm around her and then i wrapped my arms around her and hugged her in this dream and i started to cry in the dream and i didn't say to her with words but i communicated with energy that i am okay but i need to cry and you are opening that door for me right now so this happened last night then this morning I wake up, 4.30, thunderstorms, the birds are going. I go downstairs, and my dad is already there hanging out. So we talk about the dream. I see a sunrise happening, and I say, yo, let's go for a ride. Let's go chase dem colors. And as we're driving around, we pass an old guitar shop that I used to take guitar lessons at. And I was having more mom memories. And I put on this track colors by the black pumas do you know this track mm. it's pretty commercial it's like a movie song almost but yeah. it's got energy in it and as i'm driving i feel tears coming up in my eyes and i start crying and i haven't cried in months and <laughs> it's just this opening this this blossoming for me right now and i share that with you because Everything plays a part, right? The basketball game I watched last night somehow plays a part. But what I know played a significant part is when I first listened to Don't Go At mm. <laughs> And what happens for me as a music lover, but even more, I'm like this nasty track hunter. So I have this weird <laughs> relationship with music that I'm working on. But I'm like, where's the good stuff, you know? And a lot of times on the first note, I can feel it. And I'm like, oh, shit, I'm here. And my perspective on it is this is a good track, but it might go south for me. Like, don't mess it up for me. That's It's not about me, but I'm making it about me. Mm -hmm. So I hear Don't Go Asking, and I'm like, oh, oh, something is here. Like, this is from the first note, and then it's building, it's building. And then that first fucking bow, now, now, now. <laughs> and I was just like, Buckle up. This is, there is intention in this music right here. This is what we do it for. Hmm. And I listen to the track. Generally, I don't like vocals. I just don't like them. I don't want your lyrics interfering with my experience. That's just how I am. <laughs> but every once in a while, 
Every once in a while, they hit me right in the fucking heart. And I don't know who of you or your friends or what you sampled did the vocals on that. Thank you so much. That's you. Oh yeah. my god. Yeah, I, I just I just kept on layering and <laughs> it was like those chords, we really enjoyed them. And we were just kind of wondering, like, yeah, can't we just because there's something to say, but we didn't want to make it too specific. And like having just one vocal usually takes all the attention, but to have like a group singing together that already makes it more disperse and we thought maybe that way more people can connect to it and you did <laughs> so yeah man yeah yeah i think <laughs> i think some people actually kind of need vocals to guide them or they prefer it let's not say they need it but they prefer mm -hmm. that and for me generally i don't but i like vocals in foreign languages or with some level of vagueness so that i can have my own experience yeah yep. that's what i love about electronic music to me it rattles my subconscious and then whatever comes up comes up but if you're saying i miss my girlfriend why didn't i do better it's like oh fuck man like <laughs> I, I was connecting with my mom in this track and now you're taking me to my second girlfriend stop it <laughs> but you know the thing is like i you should i think this is a reason why generally you should keep lyrics a little bit more ambiguous yeah. because usually it's about communicating a feeling and not for me at least and probably for you as well but with a lyric, you can really convey like, this yeah. was my house, this is what it looked like. Or you can convey a feeling of missing your home and whether that's the spiritual home around us or being with your mom or your girlfriend or literally your home. It's so much better to convey that, that feeling beneath the story, you know? And that's really what we've been, that's what we try to do with all our tracks. Because in that sense, like, in a way, it's even more specific because you get to yeah. the core. Yeah. Whereas if you just say, I miss my home because I miss those red bricks in my home, in a way, you're being really rational about, <laughs> whereas why do you miss it? What is it about this red brick that, that you miss? <laughs> you know, and then you get to this feeling of, oh, but actually, I just feel very lonely all the time. And whenever I feel like that, I miss my home. So, you know, then we say, well, then... We should write a lyric about this loneliness because missing your home is just an example of this core feeling, you know? Yes. And for you, it's a home, but for me, it's a mom. But the yeah, feeling, exactly. 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 But the exactly. feeling is the same. And, you know, I tell people all the time that when my mom died, it opened an incredible door of empathy for me, hmm. for loss, for pain, and maybe what you lost or went through is very different on the surface than what I went through, but we connect in that feeling. And that's exactly what you're describing here. Yeah. So yeah. on that note, is there a specific experience that you were tapping into when you, when you created this? Uh, well, we had a conversation about something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You want to take this one? Yeah, um, yeah, sure. Yeah, okay, go, go. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's actually about uh, the breaking up of a, a relationship, and we both have, yeah, well, not in the same year, but we experienced the same kind of um, um, thing. What happened afterwards when you you when you were, are broken up, and then you tr you meet each other again, and then. Um, always someone asks like like starting the chit chat and then but you know like yeah this is not where it's about you know it's yeah. it's it's a deeper thing and you don't have to you don't have to ask it and yeah that's yeah like actually it was like um one of us asked the other like how do you cope with this right i was yeah. i was kind of broken up yeah like uh, roswita had a relationship like uh, like for her it's really a history thing because it's like years ago but she, you she used you had used to have 
a 12 year relationship and when that ended of course in a year after that you have to find out how you communicate again uh but the thing is you you're also moving on so in the communication after the breakup there's also pain because if you're really honest with each other you're maybe dating other people or you're forgetting what it was like to be with this person and sometimes I just had a relationship broken up just when Corona started. So that was last year. And I asked Ross Wieda, like, uh, hey, my ex is asking me how I'm doing. Mm. But if I'm really honest, then I'm saying I'm in a process of letting you go and being happy that certain elements aren't in my life anymore. Um, And of course, I don't want to say that. But if then somebody keeps asking me how I'm doing then it sort of becomes this sort of push and pull. And I was asking Roswita for advice about that. And <laughs> and in a way, it was just like, don't go asking how I'm doing. The, and after after that, we say it's all right, because it's it's okay where we are now. We don't know. We don't know each other's lives anymore in the present. And that's okay, because we need to do that for whatever reason. You know, I'm having all types of emotional responses right now because this is exactly what I interpreted when I heard the song, literally. And I mean, it's the timing (laughs) is just divine. (laughs) You guys, (laughs) yeah, fucking (laughs) nail. Nice. That one's going to be in Amsterdam in a few hours. So it'll it'll hit you in a little bit. Yeah. I'll send it back to you. But yeah, the timing for me, I mean, that's exactly where I'm at. I don't want to get into too many details out of respect for my lovely former partner. But um, we've been chatting a little bit. And it's, it's along those same lines of like... Wow, part of my process right now is is letting go of of us, I guess. And actually, I really do believe deep down that the best thing that one could do to not rectify a relationship, but to have a, a the best relationship moving forward is to let go. And that's essentially what I'm going through right now. And when I heard this track, it just... Ooh, man, it got me in that zone. So, first of all, the first is thank you. Um, yeah. On behalf of me and just <laughs> yeah. humans, let's say. Forget about electronic music fans. Let's just say humans. Because, look, what, what, you, what you made did something to me, and that changes the way I interact with my dad and my stepmom, and the strangers I see in the street, it is all connected. So the grandma that was loving my vibe at the grocery store yesterday, maybe she doesn't know your track, but she's still getting touched by it. I love this. Uh, So first of all, thank you. And second of all, just authentic, direct feedback that what you intended to send was directly received. In fact, so much that it has been difficult for me to really enjoy other music right now. So I (laughs) thank you with anger for that. (laughs) We're happy and sorry. Yeah, exactly. Like, sorry, not sorry. Sorry. Yeah. (laughs) Sorry it was that good, guys. (laughs) I always liken it to going to an amusement park. And if you ride the fastest, most exhilarating roller coaster first, and then you go on the old wooden one, it doesn't give you the same thrill. So when I discover music that touches me in a certain way, the club banger just doesn't do it for me the same. There's a time and a place for everything, and that's why I love this, but... This track really took me to another place. And then I listened to the remix and I was like, what the fuck? This is like... (laughs) They did such an amazing job. Incredible. And then having 
known the lyrics and the vocals from the original and seeing yeah, what yeah, yeah, Mira yeah. Chris did with that. Ooh. So tell me how that came about. You came up with Chris and Mira. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a huge fan of their productions and as well of their DJ sets and performing. So, but I was also a bit because made a list, you know, like who, and I was with them. I was like, okay, this is out of reach, <laughs> but <Right. fuck> it. <laughs> right. Just as a side note, like Ross, Ross Wieda is, is the one that knows all the DJs and all the tracks. I don't know anything. <laughs> I remember one. I remember one time that uh, Rosuida was talking about Richie Houghton, and I said, "Like, yeah, who's that?" <laughs> and you know, so that's me. So she was like, "Yeah, Chris and Mira is never gonna work." And I was like, "Oh, it sounds cool. Let's do it." <laughs> yes. Yeah. There's value in your. Ig there's value in your ignorance, brother. Believe. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's really um, true. Yeah. yeah. So, um, damn. But and they just did it. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of weird, but <laughs> right? Yeah, like, they were like, "Yeah, we think this is going to work. We're going to try it, and um, but we think we have a nice idea about it." So uh, then we were already like, "What?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can you take me through the feelings of that first listen of the remix when it came back to you? Oh, you should tell you should tell about when you listen to it, and then you add, because you listened to it before I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, oh, yeah, yeah, And yeah. you heard something, and then you were maybe a bit worried about. <laughs> All right, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was. It was because it's really funny because it starts out with yeah a lot of our original stems, you know, like but a bit slower and and but it's it's pretty much uh, all our stems, so that's that's all the different tracks, and then at some point you have this. And then the voice comes in and and then I was like stupefied, like, whoa. But then I instantly thought like, yeah, what, what does Merlin think of this? You know, like, because it's his voice, but then like, <laughs> and <laughs> so I, I asked him like, what do you think of it? <laughs> the voice. <laughs> and then he was like, yeah, I didn't listen to it yet. So, yeah. <laughs> Who's who's Mira? I didn't listen yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's really, yeah. God damn it, Mira! Always asking my attention. <laughs> um, so then I listened to it, and uh, I thought, okay, it's pretty cool. Oh, they did a slow version. That's nice. And then the vocals came in, all chopped up. And just as a background thing, like I, when I was a teenager, my two two tool. Uh, that my two main bands were Radiohead and Tool. And I don't know how well you know Radiohead, but they have a lot of chopped up vocals in there. And I, I love that sort of, oh, it's real, but it's also broken and it has something beautiful. Like my heart. Like my heart, <laughs> like all of our lives, why, which yeah. is why we're in music, you know, <laughs> pretending to try to heal others. But actually, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> we are all one, brother. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, but so I heard the chopped up vocals and it was like, it felt like they understood, you yeah. know. Yeah. So I was actually kind of like not really crying, but my eyes were kind of moist, <laughs> so <laughs> to speak. And and I listened and I thought, oh, I totally get it that Roswita sent me these texts, <laughs> but I actually kind of love it. And I love it that they had... I mean, it takes guts to do it yeah. like that, right? You really have to have your own sense of identity in music to make such a decision, which is happens to be one of the things that I respect the most in people in general. Mm. So I, I just thought like, so this is Chris Amira. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like, it's amazing. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, I I just, I'm I'm kind of, I don't know, proud or... It just also, it touches me. Yeah. Uh, the way they did it. That is beautiful. And thank you for sharing that with us. It's, it's so nice to hear the perspective from the artists. And um, it's funny. I want to take a moment to bring Garbage Festival to light. And I always say Garbage Gratitude. I have so much mm. gratitude for this yeah. The essence of this thing. It, it changed my life. It showed me what's possible. My first garbage 
I remember I was sitting there tripping at Buck Corner, and it was just, I literally said to myself, this is like seven times better than what I dreamed heaven could be. Seriously. And then when you open yourself to what's possible, everything changes. Um, but then in my second year of garbage, the reason I'm bringing it up right now is because before our chat today, I did a little research and I said, how did we first start talking? So I went all the way in the history of our DMs. And in August of 2019, I sent you a video that I can no longer see, which is cool. <laughs> and I said, guys, thank you so much for the dance at Garbage. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. that turned into a conversation. And then there's a couple layers to this. So I want to walk you through it. So on one hand, now we're connecting in 2019. And it led to you reaching out to me and saying, hey, I really like your videos. And I knew that we had something more than just like, hey, maybe you can do marketing for me because some artists approach me like that. Yeah. And you guys were like, we're making our, we're having our first release with the other eye. And this was the Fields EP, am I right? Yeah. There was a track on there, it was Passat. I don't know how you say it, but. Probably like that. that. Yeah, I really connected with that track. And in yeah. that moment, I felt connected with you as humans and the music and I knew it was your first release. So I put a little a little something extra on the videos and I just <laughs> watched them and I'm going to put them into this podcast as well just as a, a reflection point. Crazy as we keep sending love, we're making strong connections with artists and record labels. Rose with the uh, and the other I record label are in my heart, I love you. Congrats on your project. But it was so nice. But furthermore, there's more garbage gratitude, damn it. So at that same garbage, I actually took a ride with some people from Amsterdam. And some of those people were with the, I don't know if it was the other eye or alter ego. It's one in the same, right? It's yeah, it's, the same. it's like uh, almost the same crew, like... Yeah, yeah, so the yeah. other eye is the record label of the Alter Ego crew, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. But there was Alter Ego homies in our ride to Garbage. Nice. Nice. <laughs> so I started learning about this whole barefoot party thing that they started. And I'm like, man, this sounds like my kind of people. Yeah. During the Stavros set at the, the main stage, the Visay stage, Man, way too crowded for me. That's another conversation for another time. <laughs> but I was on the outskirts, and just by chance, I'm standing next to, I don't even know, honestly. Maybe it was Jasper. I don't know. But it was one of the top people in Alter Ego. And I was like, oh, shit. He had an Alter Ego bag. We started talking. We made a nice connection. I linked up with them afterwards which led to me gaining access to the promotions for the other eye label, which led to me waking up one day and in my inbox, it said Rose with a Nash, don't go asking EP featuring Mira and Chris remix. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I didn't really remember who you guys were. The name held significance, but we weren't, in such communication that I was like, oh, that's my fucking people. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there was something there. And then there was Chris and Mira. And then I could be wrong, but I think I saw good old Nora Q's name down there. Did yeah, he yeah, do yeah, the yeah. mastering on this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So these are all good indicators. And <laughs> yeah, then I put on the track and, you know, you know, the rest is history from there. But it was cool looking at the DMs to really recognize that we're not here having this conversation without Garbage Festival. And I wanted to just bring that to light and share that and let the creators of that festival or anyone involved in it, just to give them direct feedback that they have had a huge impact on my life. 
And the few select friends, the special ones that I told about it for the next year, they came and it it shifted their lives as well. So this is Mm -hmm. really magical stuff. And um, I just want to bring that to light and say thank you to Garbage. Yay. (laughs) Yeah, we... I was looking at our chats and we were talking about the dickish stage. And I said, you know what? I got to do this recording outside at, at fucking dickage. This is, this is my dickage forest. So Yeah, this that fight there was, was insane. Oh. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, we'll yeah. get back. We'll get back there soon. Yeah. We'll yeah. get back there. I just did a, I went to a party in Brooklyn last Sunday. And I was inspired to record a solo podcast afterwards due to my frustrations. And basically what I talked about was that it felt that 80% of the audience at this party was there as passive listeners. And what I mean by that is the music is a pleasant background experience for a social gathering. So they like the music. It's not that they don't like the music, but they're not fucking tuned in. And when you're, from my perspective, what happens is when you're really tuned in on something and someone else is really tuned in on it, don't go asking. We don't got to talk. It's like we (laughs) are fucking in it. And I call it collective consciousness. And that's what I love about parties, festivals, this whole scene is that feeling of connection while having my own experience with the music. But if more than half of the humans in attendance aren't tuned into the music, it's kind of a messy, energetic environment to take LSD. Let me tell you that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I basically was expressing that with all due respect to passive listeners it's not a knock on you because i watch football and basketball passively i like the social aspects but i'm not analyzing the defensive formations i'm not in it like that but i've chose music music is what i am going in on and i don't want to pay 80 dollars to go to a party with a subpar sound system and a lot of passive listeners in my experience This is very common in the United States of America. So I say all that to say this. How do you feel? And again, this can stay between us. How do you feel about the scene in Amsterdam? Are there certain clubs that really attract music lovers? Uh, What do you guys like there? And do you come across this passive listener concept as well? Yeah, I think... It really depends on the place you're you're going and the organization. Um, Because some, like for instance, this alter ego parties, everybody is in it. And and, um, like Spellbound is also a really nice organization. And Spellbound is perfect. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah. So, but I, yeah, it's also something I, is that the good word bragging? I bragged about (laughs) Uh, to, um, oh, uh, complain. Oh, complain. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Bragging is like, I'm so great. Look at my hair. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, yeah. I complained about that. Like some, but I think that was also a thing that like there were so many festivals that people got a bit spoiled also. Like, oh, yeah, but I can see this also. Um, yeah, I've heard him last uh, month. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and, and some festivals grew very fast. Yeah. So f- the first year you'd have this little family, and the second year yeah. it would get a little bit bigger. So the new yeah. people got absorbed into this family. But then the third year it became twice as big. Yeah. And suddenly you had all these little groups. It grows too fast. And it, yeah. gro- it grows garbage, so fast. Garbage festival. <laughs> oh, oh, what? Yeah. What? <laughs> it's weird. Anyway, yeah. I got Nature you. tells you so much, right? It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's also a thing. Like, you always need enough old people to guide the new, I think. Yeah. And, yeah. K- kind of what Roswita did for me, because I haven't been in this scene for that long. Yeah, without, without like, patting myself on the back too hard, 
this is the voice I want to represent in the in the scene and in the community. And that was my intention in recording that podcast. It wasn't to um, put down passive listeners. It was to reach out to people who may feel the same and say, hey, where where do I go to get tuned in? And if there really is nowhere, who wants to create something? And I'm talking about experiences with maybe 20, 30, 40 people. I don't need more than that. Um, to me, it's about the intention. And if we're all focused on the same thing, and that's the music, like, watch out. But that, yeah, it's so true about the like, oh, I've seen her play before, and I've seen him yeah. and this. What I'm practicing is, I don't know if it's Buddhist or what, but it's this idea that every time you see a tree, it's the first time seeing that tree. And when you really look at it like that, in this moment, it is the first time. And there's so much to get lost in this tree that I'm looking at. But I think it's natural for our brain to make patterns and make things easy, safe, and efficient. So the brain is like, oh, it's just a tree. So we're like, oh yeah, it's just a tree, whatever. Can I inject a word? What's that? Well, the word I'm thinking of when you're saying this is novelty. Yes. Right? Exactly. Because, and, and if you are only used to having attention for novelty, it means you never really go deep into any experience. You're just looking at this outside stim stimulus and you're waiting for it to do something to you. So it's, eh, I'm going to be critical now, but it's also a very lazy way of experiencing because you're just waiting for this thing to happen. And then you, you want it to move you instead yeah. of you allowing yourself to be moved. <laughs> you, you are, you are writing edits on the podcast, Rough Draft. <laughs> <laughs> about uh i'm really getting deep into this concept of internal external and ju it's just a check-in for me so when i'm laying down on my bed and i'm on instagram and i'm just searching for something to give me some kind of fulfillment i know that that's external and what happens in this external mindset is you become like a drug addict because now i'm relying on the music to make me feel good so I'm looking at it with expectations, like, hey, take me out of my misery, come on. Whereas when you're grounded internally, you said the magic word, you allow things. Yeah, man. And it's so different. Yeah. And also, real quick on that note, because you said novelty, I just yeah. watched a two-hour podcast essentially about dopamine and what that really is, because, you know, I've been using this word for years, and I finally came to learn about it. And a big aspect in dopamine release is novelty. So mm. that's this whole like, oh, bored of this, what's next, what's new, yeah, 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 and yeah. you can get caught in this sort of autopilot lifestyle where you're dependent on the circumstances around you to decide how you feel and when you live that way it's easy to get bored what's the next city what's the next girl what's the next song blah 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 whereas if you're really here now and you go sit with that tree for a couple minutes you'll see all the life going through it there's so yeah. much to be absorbed by but i think that the way that we're living our lives and the way that cell phones have evolved and social media, it's all sort of external grabs. And I think a lot of us have been conditioned now, our brains yeah. to react that way. And I'm starting to notice it in my life. And it is a huge point of concern. Like I'm yeah. grateful to be aware of it, but I'm also starting to understand the depth of it. And if it's mm. happening to me, I can only assume that it's happening to other motherfuckers. Yeah. Yeah. We were just talking yeah, about We this. were just talking about yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. Of course we're you like, were. Of course we we're talking about this all day. What were, <laughs> what were you talking about? Uh, yeah. What was the thing? You just started a conversation about the phone thing. Before. Yeah. Like I, I, when I have to do a lot of work on, on my phone or, or things like that, but there's a lot of time around it that you're just doing this, you know, like automatically it's just yeah 
oh, I have to do this work thing. And, and like five minutes later or 45 minutes later, you're still, oh, I have to do something, you know. And I open Instagram to post a video and there's a ass and a thong that just shakes in my face. And then next thing you know, 30 minutes later, I forgot why I even fucking opened the app. Yeah. It was for the ass and a thong, by the way. Oh my God, I've been resisting the powers of universal flow through Instagram. Thank you, brother, you're right. <laughs> my God. Fuck that video I wanted to upload. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's heavy, it's deep, and... um. Quite frankly, I think we deserve better. And for documentaries like The Social Experiment or whatever, did you watch this one? Oh, The Social Dilemma, probably. Whatever mm -hmm. it is. You know what I'm yeah, talking about, Yeah, that right? one. Like, yeah. It's to the point now where we're watching this. Conscious humans are watching this, and then we're going, and we're still fucking using the app. What is wrong with us? Like, <laughs> yeah, I want to help build a more sustainable platform where we can connect with each other but not get our brains whirled and manipulated in a million different directions and that, that might take some time but i think that we're in the early stages of the internet and social media if you really think about it so this is part of the process to getting to to where we're going to be yeah yeah definitely yeah and there are, i i see a lot of people around me feeling the same thing and wanting to start like yeah. something yeah. you know yeah this is it and like make no mistake about it this whole pandemic situation um big bursts of racial inequality and just in inequality in general all this stuff is coming to the surface during these past couple of years and now the advancement in technology with blockchain and cryptocurrencies. I mean, yo, we are in the wild, wild west right now. And I'm, I'm fucking loving it, honestly. I think it's yeah. a, great, a great time to be alive. Um, yeah. But yes, I, I want to voice my opinion on these things because I know that there's some smart fucking computer programmer sitting in a room right now that has all the skills to do it, but maybe doesn't want to get on a camera and talk about it. And it's like, hey, yeah. <laughs> I'll do that part. Like, I'll market it. But I need I need the team to make it happen. So I'm in no rush, but I think that we're we're making steps in that direction. And it's it's nice to see. Cool. Do you guys play a lot in Amsterdam? Well, not now. No. But gen normal in uh, normal in re whatever regularly is that. Well, our first record kind of came out during Corona, so so uh, like as Roswita Nash, we don't know how much we play yet. We'll have to see that next year. <laughs> uh, but you had some solo shows. Yeah. Right. And yeah. and I'm also. I'm in a lot of different projects and I, I was in a few bands that uh, that are touring all the time, basically, uh, in and outside of Amsterdam. Are you are you doing vocals for these bands? Well, it's kind of it's kind of weird, but my profile. All right. I'm, let me just tell you a little bit about my history <laughs> and my musical history. So I started out as a singer songwriter when I was like 14. Uh, Wait, hold on, hold on. Let's let's just stop right there. How the fuck does that happen at 14 years old? You're writing tr you're writing songs. Well, all right. Well, we have to go back a little bit more. That's right. Let's do it. All right. I remember being at this place. It wasn't my house. It was just a house where there were a lot of kids. It was a party or something, and there was this keyboard there. And you know that every keyboard has this demo button, right? And then it just starts playing. And I was four, maybe five, sort of just figuring out what notes I liked with my two index fingers. And there was this other guy, this stupid kid. <laughs> and he, he kind of pushed me aside and said like, you're stupid, this sounds way better. And he pressed a demo button and he started, and he started <laughs> pretending that he was playing it. And I, I got furious because it was fake. This is me at four or five years old. And I pushed him away again, you know, yeah. told him to go fornicate somewhere else. And uh, 
I put the demo off and then just immediately in my own bubble, not realizing that I had been aggressive, like figuring out those notes again. So it was just, it was a thing that I did. And I remember playing Final Fantasy VII for all the geeks out there. All right, so this is only for the geeks, but the moment that Sephiroth kills Aeris, there's this piano tune, you know, and it's really cool. And I just, I was really touched by it because I was a teenager. So I started just trial and error, figuring out the chords and thinking, oh, so this is, if I play this, that is what it feels like. So for some reason, it turned into a concept. It's just how I work. Um, and then I said, but then if I do that, then I can also create this feeling. It's easy <laughs> because you're an arrogant teenager. Yeah. Um, that's how it started. And I just started writing stuff because of my teenage angst and you know past trauma and stuff sure. and um uh and then I've, after a while you play in a band because it's cool and then you start listening to music trying to recreate that and so you start off as a singer songwriter you play piano and you sing and then you turn into a session musician and into a producer and it just sort of you know the ball keeps rolling and it gets bigger and bigger as it keeps rolling and then how did you guys how did you guys come into connection? Well That's a nice story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's my history. Um, <laughs> how did we meet? <laughs> yeah, it's a nice story. Yeah, uh Tinder. Yeah. <laughs> oh yes. I love this. Tell me more. Yeah, it was yeah. Actually you saw my picture one of my pictures, I think I'm behind the decks. Yeah. You're DJing. Yeah. yeah. And then he was like, I look you up and I replayed the intro of this set you made. <laughs> Yo, that's either going to win your heart over or you're going to block this guy immediately. Yeah. I was like, okay, this is nice. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and one of the, se uh, the second thing you said was like, yeah, we're probably not gonna, going to date, but to make music. <laughs> I was like, okay, like nice. That. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, but then we we did the date anyway. Yeah. But then, yeah. yeah, we immediately started making music, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And when was this? How long have you been making music together? Uh, 2017 or something. Yeah. 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 yeah we just spent a long time messing around. I think we just had like this two or three year period where we were just in our cave discovering who we were musically together wow yeah and then we had our first ep that's fields. basically it. yeah yeah fields exactly yeah yeah well i love what you guys are doing thank you <laughs> amazing thank you tender <laughs> <laughs> you know i really like that story because there's all types of stigmas around dating sites of course but like anything in life it's how you use it yeah and yeah. some of the some people that i'm like really close to now i met through dating apps and we were never physically intimate it, it wasn't just about that it was just a way to be open to meeting other people and to think that that's what brought all this here together that's cool i like that shout out to tinder yeah tinder <laughs> it's just my perspective and my feedback but there there seems to be like when I listen to tracks sometimes I feel like and I don't know how accurate this is but it's just my experience and I, I feel like wow this track really has intention behind it whereas a lot of other tracks it's like wow what a cool groove and this is fun but like kind of stays on the surface level for me Mm -hmm. And what's ideal for me is when you can get both. If you got yeah. a great groove and you're pulling my heartstrings, now yeah. we're talking. And you guys are playing in that space from my perspective. For me, everybody has their own taste, of course, whatever, whatever. But I really do feel uh, emotional activation when I'm listening to your music and... That's like the greatest compliment I could give to to a creator. So Thanks. thank you for what you're doing and for what it's worth. Yeah, it's working. So yeah. I just want to give you that feedback and 
you know, you got to do what's right for you, but I want to encourage you guys to lean in and trust your instincts as artists, because I know for some people you're trying to find your sound or is this, are they going to like this? Are they going to like that? You know, my, I would love to encourage you to just fucking do you all the way. And I'm sure you are, but yeah, you guys are onto something special and it's appreciated. So mm-hmm. I'm like probably going to end this call and get on Google flights, look up a little Amsterdam action. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm going to use this opportunity to invite myself to a studio session with you two because that would be a bit of a dream come true for me to just see it turning knobs and kind of see what a jam session is like in the studio. Where do you guys record? Uh, yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe we should. Are you in the studio? Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Wait. Just, just Yeah, okay. So... <laughs> Ah, but my laptop is hooked up. All right, so let's see. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Holy shit. Okay, mm-hmm. so help me understand. Why What do? What do, Why so many keyboards, right? What do they offer different? Uh, What's that over there? Hey, let's go back over there. Uh, <laughs> is that a bed? No, actually, that's a... All right, yeah. That's a mixing desk. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> why so many keyboards? I see this all the time, and I'm like, wow. But why? Yeah. the The thing is, all right. To start with, we share the studio with uh, some other people, so we can make rent. Yeah, of course. Uh, and one of the people we share it with is another keyboardist, and he is really into that stuff. I tend to like to have one tool, and like go really deep into it. So. I don't, not all those keyboards are mine. Sure. Uh, but why so many? What is the functionality difference in, in a couple of different keyboards, for example? Uh, well, how technical should I get? Yeah. Um, I, I, I would say that instruments made in a certain age sound like that age. Mm. So if you want to have that old sound, you, you better get an old keyboard. Wow. And then you're going to need the adapter and the yeah, I love that. But of of course, it's more it's more nuanced than that. Yeah. And we always come back to the same We always come back to the same keyboard, which is the Prophet. The Prophet. The Prophet. <laughs> the Prophet. Shout out to Prophet. Shout out to Prophet. <laughs> we always come back to that one. Um but I mean, there are so many sounds and the more you get into it, the more subtle it becomes. Mm. So, so that means you start buying stuff which sounds a little bit different to you, but someone who doesn't know anything about it will say it sounds the same. You know? I love, I love that world of subtle details. And you only get there when you focus on one thing. You can't do that with everything. You need the deep focus to do that. And, and the weird thing is maybe the audience doesn't hear the difference, but it can help you in your own process to make the musical decisions. And the audience does hear that. They feel it. They feel it. Yeah, exactly. That's cool. You know? But it's also just geeking out. Definitely. You know? But you got to geek out. <laughs> yeah. And if you're playing with more confidence because you know that this little key is different, it's going to yeah. allow you to flow and, and perform at a higher level, I believe. Yeah. And the audience may not know why, but they don't motherfucking need to know everything. Don't go asking. Don't go, <laughs> don't go asking, you know. Stop asking me so many questions, damn it. <laughs> so what are you doing today? Are you working on music? Yeah, yeah. we're actually yeah. doing a remix. We're working on a remix, so... Um... What's that like? What do you like doing remixes? Yeah, do we are we enjoying ourselves today? Yeah, we are enjoying ourselves today. Yeah. Good. Uh, what is it like? It's really funny because you get um, you can take a look in someone's kitchen. You know, like yeah. how how yeah. does someone do it, and how do we do it, and how can you merge it and uh, pay respect to the original track, but also do Stay, your own. Yeah. Thing? Yeah. yeah. Staying on yourself. So. That's that's really nice, but there, yeah. the, the, the fundament is already there, and then you're... Yeah. <laughs> I always refer to the blank canvas as a creator, and yeah. it's when you're, st- you're staring at the blank canvas, you're like, oh, shit, where do I start? Um, 
sometimes it's nice to have something started and it's like, oh, let me put my own little spin on this. Yeah. It's it's like in a way it's more reactive. Yeah. Like you have to be just active when you start. You just have to start. Yeah. But when somebody gives you their songs and they give you all the elements as, you know, that you can influence in any way that you like, you react to what they make. And you also make decisions about what you like and you make decisions about what you don't like. And it's really also a processing of letting go that, oh, I don't really like this element out of your track. That's nothing personal. What can we do with this? So, yeah. And um, it's pretty awesome. Again, this can stay between us privately. But I'm really interested in like the egos and the music scene and just the artist scene. And, you know, what happens when you send your track to be remixed and the remix is incredible and everybody loves the remix and nobody pays attention to the original? Like, we all want to sit here and say, whatever, it is what it is. But does that, does that feel a certain way? I mean, have you encountered that or do you know people that have? Have we encountered this feeling? No. I don't think we have. We don't. Yeah. No. Um, okay, so this never happened before, but maybe we can imagine what it would be like. Yeah. Because on one hand, it's giving tons of eyes on your project. If it's your EP, but the one remix got all the shine. On one hand, it's people are still seeing you, but I think on the creative side, it's like, no, I, I made that. <laughs> you know, I don't know. By the way, you can keep this answer in the interview if you like. Okay. As far as I'm concerned. As far as I'm concerned. Sure. I know what I would feel like. Should I start? Yeah. All right. Sure. I would probably, like, the negative trigger for me would be a feeling that I'm not good enough. Right. But my defensive mechanism would probably turn that into analyzing what made that other song work and your own song not. That's growth mindset, brother. Yes, but the danger in that is that uh, it could be that the original track, even though people don't like it as much, it could be that it was really me. Yeah. So there is a danger for me that I would step away from myself because people like the remix more. And I would struggle with that and I would find that after a while, maybe a month or something, <laughs> I would realize the only thing I can do is accept this because every other decision will take yeah. me away from myself. I love you. Know. you. I love you. <laughs> I, I really do. I don't give a shit if everybody likes the mirror remix. It doesn't matter. You 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 are stealing yeah. my heart in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Yes. So good. Yeah. Did you did you have something, Rose? No, I think the same. I'm calling you Rose from now on. Rosie? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's still still really beautiful that you are the you are the base of the track, like the, the basis and and yeah. So it's still it's still you there. Yeah. Um yeah, and if the remix is also really nice, I think I probably would be like, Yeah, but this is a really nice track, so it deserves a big yeah. crowd. And yeah. I think yeah. you have a way you are way better at that stuff than I am. I tend to take it way more personal in that yeah. That fucking demo button traumatized you. Yeah. <laughs> that super fucking kid. Jesus. Yeah, it really did. <laughs> look at the look at the energy that still comes up, what, twenty five years later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a chip on my shoulder that has to do with authenticity. Well, I I grew up um we have a lot of uh, spiritual people around me and there was a lot of spiritual bypassing going on. But you're like six and you don't know what it is, but you know something is wrong. So I had this very big anti-feeling like who cares about all this inside spiritual stuff? Just go with gut feeling because making it into a mental thing is bullshit. All you people are bullshit. Um, so I was always really rigidly looking for authenticity which of course didn't work um so i can sometimes still flare up in, in conversations like that but a lot of the anger and disappointment around being yourself and what it means to be yourself is long gone well at least it, oh, just checking yeah it is yeah it is i think it's a perpetual process right 
and there's yeah. layers and layers that are always evolving. But hearing you say that is so nice because when I started the Army of Love project, I didn't even know what electronic music was. I was listening to Tom Mish and hip hop and shit like that at the time. The reason I started the Army of Love project is because based on my own life experience, I knew how challenging it was to really accept myself. And I had only made these tremendous strides after my mom had died and that took me to deeper places. And then I had this particularly special experience in San Francisco, which I'll have to do a documentary about. We're not going to get into the details now. But the point is, I felt very privileged to have this community experience that really opened a new door for me to step towards acceptance. And I say self-acceptance, but it's really acceptance of what is happening around us and allowing it. And uh, to hear you, you explain that, it's like, this is like the third time in this conversation that you've been a great compliment to the messages that I'm trying to get out there. So it's just <laughs> like, thank you, universe. I don't know. Can you hear the birds through this? Yeah. yeah it sounds <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> oh, man. This has been such a nice chat, really. I, I had like small intentions with it and I knew that we could just flow and in terms of content I was like well we could probably take a couple of clips and that'll be great and yeah. I'm fairly confident that we got some great stuff in here mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. before I do anything of course I'll be in touch with you guys um, I think it goes without say that I'm on your team here I'm not looking yeah. for a hot take uh, yeah. but this is cool and Look, man, if I'm being honest, when I start going out to Europe and really connecting with artists, I think this whole movement that I'm working on is going to grow a lot. And I, it's like I get along with everyone, but I don't really get in there with everyone. And I'm really feeling that with you guys. So I just want to let you know that. I appreciate you as artists, but even deeper than that, I appreciate you as humans, and it's been really refreshing and energizing to come on here and chat with you about music, life, everything. Yeah. So thank you for taking time to meet with me and also to share with whoever is watching this and yeah. listening to this. I think it's really really connecting stuff and uh i feel more connected to you and that makes me happy and that's all i'm trying to say here so thank you guys <laughs> thank you too. thank you so much yeah <laughs> the same here you work on that remix today and you know if you ever want to send me music the door is open to do so no pressure <laughs> <laughs> but um what do we got it's next I, June 25th is a big day for music. There's a lot of shit coming out. It's a Friday in the summer. But that's yeah, the yeah, release yeah. day for you guys, right? The 25th? Yeah, 25th. Yeah, 25th. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Motherfuckers. Congratulations. Thank you. Looking forward. Yeah, we really are. The feedback <laughs> has been great. And um, yeah, you guys are incredible. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And I can't wait to come to Amsterdam. And Yeah, give a shout. Yeah, drop us a like. You know what I really want to do in Amsterdam with you guys? Drugs. No, I want to wait until Nash is in the flow on the keyboard and then just push him over and press the demo button. <laughs> see if we can awaken that lost echo inside of you and maybe we can reconcile and become friends with that asshole, that asshole kid. Exactly. So I will hug you when you do that. Now we're projecting. I already gave you too much. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I think in due time you'll forget and I'll come. And we'll have a great time. And boom, I got you. Don't worry. I got you. <laughs> I love you guys. Love you too, man. Thank you so much. This Thank is fun. Thank you so much. Have a good yeah. weekend. You and, too. Uh,